Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Hamant Tanasia. Hamant is the managing partner of the venture capital firm, General Catalyst, and the author of the new book, Unscaled, How AI and a New Generation of Upstarts Are Creating the Economy of the Future. Hamant is also the founder and executive chairman of Comure, a San Francisco-based technology company focused on accelerating healthcare software innovation. In this interview, we discuss the theses behind Unscaled and how companies need to be intentional about scaling their businesses, including ways in which they can best do so. Hamant emphasizes the importance of integrating General Catalyst's values in the companies he grows, evaluating long-term consequences of those investments. He also gives his perspective on businesses that focus on social good and how artificial intelligence can be used to measure consequences of investment decisions. Finally, we discuss how Hamant's approach to investing has changed over the pandemic and why writing allows him to hone his thought process, among a variety of other topics. Well, Hamant Taneja, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thanks for having me, Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure. Well, uh, Hamant, I, I thought we'd begin with your role. You are a managing partner at uh, General Catalyst. Uh, talk a bit, if you would, wouldn't mind, about your firm, General Catalyst, and, and uh, more specifically about some of the areas that you focus on uh, as an investor. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I talk about the firm, I usually talk about the mission. And uh, so General Catalyst, our mission is to invest in positive, powerful change that endures. The... Uh, overall body of work that the firm focuses on, frankly, starts to represent the overall economy because we're, we're a firm that invests in a diversified set of sectors. We have large practice investing in consumer and enterprise uh, uh, software companies. We do a lot in healthcare, which is our thesis of health assurance. Uh, we have a fairly large practice in fintech. Uh, and then we also do work in uh, always in new areas that are emerging uh, in terms of, you know, uh, crypto or when you think about some work in sustainability and uh, it's a global firm. So we, we do invest uh, all over the world. Part of our core belief is that we want to support great entrepreneurs where they're building companies. And, and so that has taken us to interesting spots in the world as well. That's a great overview. I'd love to uh, delve a little bit more deeply into that mission, um, Amon's investing in po positive, powerful change that endures. I uh, would love to sort of break that down a little bit uh, as to what constitutes positive as well as uh, powerful change and, and endure enduring. Uh, talk a little bit about what each of those components, how you define each of them. And enduring, yeah. perhaps a little bit more obvious, but the positive aspect and the, the powerful change. Talk about that. A absolutely. So, so you know, um, so the firm started about, about a little over twenty years ago uh, in the uh, in the Boston area, and we actually sat down and redid our mission values uh, work about a couple of years ago. We said, "Hey, the world's changed a lot in terms of the kinds of things technology is used to build, and we should revisit who we are as human beings and what's the kind of work we want to do." And there was a deep commitment. Uh, to build an enduring firm. And, uh, and uh, uh, inside of that, we sort of said, what is, what is the core idea that brings all of our work together? And it's based on the observation that the role of technology has become far greater uh, today than it was 20 plus years ago when we started the firm, when we were mostly writing software oriented companies that brought efficiency into our lives, whether as consumers or, you know, uh, business people. And, uh, but today we actually build healthcare companies and banks and insurance companies and schools. And, you know, some of them live on the internet, some are uh, omni-channel. And so that's a lot of great responsibility. And so part of uh, what led to that mission and the idea of positive uh, is to build uh, companies uh, that affect our lives in these core areas in a way that's positive for us and our society as a whole. I suppose in, this, in the context of the level of impact we're having. And, you know, if I put my financial hat on for a second, you would say the very best investments are companies that come on for a long, long time. And in the areas that we're talking about today, the only kinds of companies that can come on for a long time are the ones that create that positive change in society. And so that's that's a lot of sort of how we got there and thinking through who we are and the type of work we want to do, uh, which is high performance, but also high impact uh, in the world. 
Very interesting. And I, I wonder, as somebody who invests in firms, you also help lead a firm in, in addition to that. How do you think about the, uh, the, the, the sort of living those same values internally with the firm you continue to grow? Oh, it's, 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 uh, it's absolutely something I think about all the time. And, you know, the benefit I have is I have the luxury of writing shotgun with some amazing founders, whether it's, you know, John and Patrick at Stripe or Glenn Tolman, who built Livongo and now building Transcan or Josh Reeves, Augusto. And so you get to see how they think about building and doing firms. And then we have a lot of uh, amazing people on our own team, including our chairman, Ken Chenault, who ran American Express, which was an enduring firm. So I would say probably my thinking is derivative of all these great human beings on how we think about our own uh, endurance. But, uh, you know, we do try to live the same values that uh, we um, suggest to our founders uh, to build those long-term compounding companies. And, uh, you know, it all comes down to, uh, you know, building a culture that's designed uh, to thrive and, uh, you know, it's all about sort of having that long-term orientation in all the decisions you make. And, you know, in our, in our business, venture capital used to be an artisanal industry. And when I got into business, people would say, you don't want to think about how you run your own venture capital firm, because the more time you spend inward, the less time you spend the founders and lower your performance will be. That was the mindset. So it literally was uh, almost an acknowledgement that we're not a business, we're not a company. And today, as we scale and we support founders globally and we help them through, you know, uh, often two decades of company building as partners to them, we do have to think long term. That can only happen if we build our own business with the same rigor and have a foundation of culture and values uh, like our founders do. So that was a mindset change that us and others in the industry have had to go through as the industry matures. Yeah, it's interesting background. Uh, in your book, Unscaled, you talk about um, the necessity to to invest in or the desire to invest in in areas uh, where economies of unscale, as you describe it. Um, and I wonder if you could take a moment and describe further what you mean by that. Yeah. So look, if you think about business in uh, the 20th century, scale was the mode, right? I mean, and there was this obsession with scaling everything. We scaled our banks, we scaled our healthcare systems and our hospitals, we scaled our power plants, we scaled our corporation, right? It was all about uh, getting things to achieve economies of scale so we could do services and products that were good enough for as many people as possible from the affordability standpoint. That was the goal. But then when we started organizing, you know, content, community, commerce, now care on the internet, we started having this opportunity to leverage a lot of the platforms that gave you the advantages that scale used to have in big corporations. So you could rent scale. So then you could actually build companies that were traditionally considered subscale because the CapEx requirements aren't that good. You can rent servers, right, from Amazon and you can rent uh, logistics from FedEx and, and whatnot. And so that led to founders starting to work on ideas that originally uh, initially would seem small because they would really focus on small targets of consumers, but try to give them something that they truly wanted versus something that was good enough for them. And that mindset of mass personalization really started to dominate uh, the incumbent mindset of mass production. So when we started seeing that happening, I actually wrote this paper in HBR in 2013, and I, I wrote about this whole economies of unscaled teaching of like, boy, we're going to end up rewriting all parts of society on uh, in this digital transformation, and the business is changing. And that really uh, made us grow up in understanding the level of responsibility, because the role of these companies was far greater, the scope of ambition and, and scale that you could now think about in terms of the size of these companies, what they could be. And frankly, as a result, sort of, you know, thinking about our own evolution as a firm to say, well, how do we support companies that you know, someday we'll do tens of billions of dollars in revenue and we're still being built on venture capital. That that was not what the game was 20 years ago. So so that that book was, you know, I wrote it to try to make sense of what was going on um, uh, in the world and figure out how do we become intentional about this next phase. And, and that has been my thesis essentially since then um, and how I think about it and the various industries and how to approach them. 
Do you see it at all as like a contrast to some of what Reid Hoffman, for example, writes with uh, hyperscaling? Uh, it, it, they're, they're not, you're, it's, not to, it's not to say, of course, that you're against scaling businesses. You've invested in a great number of them that have scaled remarkably. But there's, there are aspects of what you're describing, which um, uh, you, there's a degree of intentionality that at least it seems to be a different emphasis than. Yeah. You know, so, so look, Reid's a great trend. Actually, when he wrote the book, book Bits Blitz Scale, he gave it to me and he wrote on it, Scaling the Unscaling. So, so a lot of what Reid is talking about in Blitz Scaling actually is, to me, is orthogonal in terms of, hey, in the context of the problem you're trying to build a business around, what is uh, the best way to win? Right, uh, but it's it's not uh, that doesn't mean it's acknowledging that every company has a physics to just maximize go as fast as possible. Every company's got its own physics to how fast it should be grown. And he talks a lot about what are the best practices to achieve their maximum potential. What we're talking about and what I've been thinking about is just the intentionality in which you build these companies so that you're not you're not moving fast and breaking things. Right, uh, we're not borrowing an engineering design principle and applying it to societal design. I mean, that's really what, you know, a lot of my focus has been on. Um, uh, but a lot of the learnings that Reed has, I mean, you know, our companies use them. And I think he's just an incredibly thoughtful uh, uh, operator and investor. And I've learned a lot from him over the years. You delve uh, this again, back to your mission of, of investing in positive, powerful uh, change that endures. Your, your latest book, Intended Consequences, you talk about um, you know why social good businesses, those that focus on that, uh, can be some of the greatest opportunities today for investors, for people to join those companies, and so on. Those that are addressing climate change, or you know inequality, or or chronic disease, these sorts of things. Uh, talk a little bit about um, that emphasis, that that thinking about. Uh, the sort of double or triple bottom line, uh, how those can be really important, uh, important areas to focus. Yeah, look, that emphasis uh, uh, comes from a deep conviction, both at a personal and at a business level uh, for me. Um, you know, when you think about, as I was saying earlier, uh, the very best investments, those are companies that um, are going to keep growing uh, for a long, long time. But guess what? If you are providing banking for the traditionally unbanked population or you know, taking care of consumers with you know, chronic conditions like diabetes or building an online high school for kids that are in sort of ninth grade and on, you are not going to build a business that's going to keep growing if it has adverse effects on society. You might grow in the short term, but in the long term, society is not going to allow you to uh, really exist and thrive. As investors... We're looking for companies that are going to keep growing in the long term so that we can maximize return for our investors. So I think I think the, the whole point of intended consequences is that now that technology is literally reorganizing our society digitally in every aspect of it, um, it is a false choice between great financial return and great impact. In fact, you know, our raison d'etre is to you know, go out there and prove that the very best performance financially you're going to create as investment firms is if you get behind this idea of building companies that are truly going to have great societal, uh, you know, positive societal uh, impact for a long, long time. One of the areas which, of course, has, has drawn in tremendous venture capital in recent years where that some believe uh, is fraught with some of the issues you describe is artificial intelligence and the necessity to think about the long-term consequences of some of the short-term investments uh, that are being made. What, what are some of your own uh, perspectives on, yeah, on, on look, that? I've, so uh, on scale, we talked about how AI is the underpinning for a lot of this. And you know, I, I, I always start with sort of a thought experiment. If, 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 if you and I were on this Zoom staring at the very first internal combustion engine, and uh, somebody said to us, it's going to transform society with so much positive, but it's also going to cl create climate change. How would we have adopted that technology differently? Right now, it was 120 years before we knew that the carbon footprint was changing because of the internal combustion engine. And all of a sudden, now the industries are set and there's a lot of inertia. And we've been fighting this idea of is there even climate change for 50 years now? Right. Let alone do something about it. Unlike that, which is how the world used to be, with AI, you actually can measure 
second and third order consequences of what you're building uh, from the beginning, right? And and obviously we didn't have the foresight to do that, uh, you know, as a tech diaspora that was building Facebook and, uh, you know, you end up creating lots of issues um, in terms of cat creating echo chambers because they were good for monetization, but perhaps bad for society. And there were these second order uh, issues. We think, and we talk about this in intended consequences, there's best practices that can be created uh, to avoid those kinds of issues in the future. I have this notion that, hey, when you build products that touch human beings, have this notion of what we call algorithmic canaries. So you're understanding what are the second and third order effects of your products, not just on the consumers that you're selling to, but also other stakeholders in society. So I think that stakeholder mindset uh, is, is very, very important uh, in building these companies to be resilient and positive for the long term. Like, I mean, I'll give you an example. If you were giving out college loans as a business and your whole algorithm was, let's go find the kids that went to uh, terrific schools like Harvard and Princeton and MIT and, you know, all the Ivy Leagues uh, because they're going to all have jobs and be low risk pool. Great. You'll have a good business for the short term, but now the banks have to lend to the rest of the population, which is a higher risk pool, and it becomes untenable for society to actually bring along, uh, you know, uh, uh, kids and make college affordable. Well, that's not a great long-term uh, stasis. It's not going to work. So, are you measuring these kinds of effects on your on your business and and addressing those from from the beginning? So, I think that's that's a lot of the mindset and the mechanisms we talk about in this book are all catered towards that kind of intentional company building. Very interesting. Uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned earlier, one of the areas that you cover is healthcare, which is also a, a topic in your book, Unhealthcare. Uh, in the book, you talk about a, a data-driven cloud-based category of healthcare that you refer to as health assurance. Uh, and you go on to talk about how um, following some of the principles associated with this can, can help us all be healthier at a lower cost. And, um, you know, it's some of the broader implications of this talk a bit more about what you mean by health assurance and the tech, the, the role of technology and data in bringing that to life. Yeah, absolutely. So health assurance, uh, you know, we tried to frame that if we were to go down this path of, uh, a decade long transformation of our healthcare business and organized care on the internet. Um, what needs to happen on the other side? This is a long-term intentionality point. First and foremost, we wanna create these consumer experiences that deliver proactive care. And we ended up having a lot of conviction that that can be done because uh, uh, you know, we're involved in helping build Livongo, which was the first uh, you know, digital health company with a consumer experience that truly scaled. You know, it was acquired by uh, Teladoc for eighteen and a half billion dollars, but more importantly, built an experience for consumers with diabetes that was like a, the NPS was as high as Apple's. Right, that was that was the thing I was the most proud of in the way that company got built. And so we said, how about we go build Livongo for every persona? And, I'm, and when I say we, I mean not just GC and our founders, but just the technology diaspora. Second thing was we need to do everything in this transformation of the health system of our country in a way that reduces the GDP of healthcare because we need to make it more affordable for everybody. Third thing was do it in a way that we truly address health equity, right? It's an enormous issue in society. And then obviously in the middle of writing the book, the pandemic happened. And uh, you know, if you look at sort of uh, how many problems we got exposed to out of the pandemic as well, you know, it really became a place where we laid out a roadmap to say, hey, how do we think about bringing that health assurance end game for all the different segments of consumers. And, you know, honestly, I feel like our team hasn't taken a breath over the last uh, couple of years of the pandemic and we've just been actively investing to, you know, help catalyze that ecosystem we th that we think can be, uh, you know, per delivering the promise of health assurance. Talk a bit about more broadly speaking about the implications of the, uh, the crisis on how you've thought about investing. I mean, everything from presumably for the first time in a uh, perhaps in your existence as an investor, I, I have to imagine you've probably been making some investments in companies whose executives you've not been in the same room as, as a starting point. Uh, but also some of the other factors at play, you've mentioned a number of them in their application to what we're describing, that if anything, the, the pandemic has been a, 
a catalyst for greater levels of innovation and creative th uh, thinking as it has been, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. There's been a lot of necessity in the past two years. Um, talk a bit about some of the changes to your own business and the way in which you operate and, and think about investing as a result of the consequences of the past couple of years of the pandemic. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I'll just to give you a little bit of insight into what was happening in like March, April of 2020 in our firm. Um, we were literally working with each of our companies to say, you need a plan, a three-part plan that first and foremost keeps your teammates, here's the conversation with the founders, your teammates safe. Second was play defense because you really don't know in terms of market uncertainty what's going to happen. Uh, and then the third was, you know, a, this whole idea of, you know, if every crisis comes great opportunity, you know, figure out how you're going to really lean in and take advantage of this crisis and build a more resilient business that's on the right side of history. So we probably went and did that with, you know, dozens and dozens of our companies. And 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 Ken uh, Chenault, he led a lot of these leadership seminars on how do you just have the courage to, and, and to sort of, you know, essentially get, define reality and give hope uh, to get through that time. Remember how what a dark period it was sort of at that time. And, and boy, our business, no one knew it was gonna turn into this, in hindsight, it's an obvious comment, but this huge acceleration of the digital society, because technology was used uh, at a much more accelerated pace to, to get our groceries and to get our telehealth. And, and so it actually ended up becoming a boon for our business, which forced us to scale the fastest we have ever scaled uh, in the last two years in the history of the firm. And that's, again, not unique to us, which means we hired a lot of people at the same time as well that hadn't met. That dynamic of how you build a, a company fundamentally changed for us and for everybody else. We became a hybrid environment. I think that also unleashed, the pandemic also unleashed innovation globally because everything that I just talked about was happening in every country, right? So it just created this acceleration of great opportunities in all parts of the world, which in turn forced us to, to get, you know, uh, a, a more aggressive in our own plan. So it's been, it's been a massive uh, accelerant. I mean, I, I even started a company with these two amazing founders in uh, in Philadelphia that I have never that I had never met for the first year, but we were able to get a company off the ground together, like on Zoom. You know, it just that that idea. If you asked me twenty years ago, would I ever do that? I would say that's nuts. And now I think that's you know that's just par for the course. So a lot changed, uh, and uh, and I do think. Some of it will snap back because we do want to feel a sense of community, both at work at home. But I do think you will do your um, creativity uh, work in person and you'll do your productivity work on Zoom. That's my framework and how I spend time now. That's a good, good way to frame it. I wanted to also ask you, um, you're not the only uh, venture investor who's written books, but you know, you've written several of them, uh, you know, more, more than most. What, what, what is it that's drawn you to uh, taking investment theses or ideas that you've had and, and represent them in book form? Is it, is it a means of further clarifying your, your points in addition, of course, to feeling as though you've got some perspectives that, that deserve a broader audience? Yeah, it's, you know, it's clarify, share, and iterate, right? I mean, I think it's a way to, uh, you know, become uh, more convicted in, in uh, our own thinking, but then also sort of throw it out there and get you know, uh, uh, everybody else's view so we can all be learning together. I think, I think this, this uh, focus on building responsible innovation uh, oriented companies, uh, I don't think that works if it's just going to be us, you know? So I think this book, especially, I was very keen to write because my hope and goal is that next generation of investors and founders really embrace this mindset uh, and embrace these mechanisms as they, uh, think about how to tackle new ideas and how to build their own cultures and business model choices and products and and uh, uh, you know so that we can really recenter technology as a force for good. I mean that's really my my goal and you know personally it's been a pretty good run for 20 years uh, and if I'm going to do it for another 20, it really is motivated by uh, you know helping uh, set technology on a path to be in service of society uh, and. Uh, you know, this book hopefully will catalyze more conversation and and build upon these thoughts because we're early. I don't think I, I, we have everything thought through by any means, 
Um, but I think there's enough in there to spark the conversation and get everybody thinking about it. As, as you mentioned, your latest book really does delve into a lot of these people topics, culture topics, uh, all of which have been turned on their head to some extent by virtue of the fact, as you pointed out before, that we are so many of us primarily uh, operating virtually, at least for the time being. Uh, again, the sorts of things that even a couple of years ago, if you were to ask most people if it would be possible to you know, assemble a, a cohesive culture and make people feel like they're part of something broader than just themselves while never being in the same space with their colleagues, they would say that you're nuts as well. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, how do you, and you add to that, of course, the, 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 the rethinking so many people are doing um, as to the role that work plays in their life and, you know, perhaps reprioritizing as a result of this grand experiment that's been foisted upon us. I wonder what other sort of conclusions you're drawing as, as, a, as an employer of people, a collaborator with people in your own team, as somebody who funds uh, entrepreneurs who themselves go out and build teams during these trying times at a time where there's this great resignation happening in so many places, where there's a paucity of, of great uh, talent, especially technical talent. You know, what, what sorts of new conclusions have you drawn as to what are the difference makers in building a great team? Yeah, look, I think I think the biggest um, thing I would say is the digital divide only got greater as technology got accelerated, right? So much of the value concentrates to so few um, uh, in, in the way the technology ecosystem builds itself that we're widening the gap. And uh, this, this mindset of, you know, creating these really valuable companies um, uh, sort of wins over the inclusive mindset of taking care of the workforce and, and again, the second and third order consequences in a way that everybody benefits. I think uh, sort of understanding that that is not sustainable uh, and that is not how even the best founders life's work is going to perpetuate, which is what they care about first and foremost. They are, a lot of them are very mission driven uh, and thinking about how to have a, a deeper economic inclusion, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, what we're, you know, some of my teammates are starting to call inclusive prosperity, uh, you know, in the way we set these teams and cultures up is a very um, uh, important and urgent topic uh, for us because so much of the application of technology and creation of these new businesses getting accelerated, so much of it's going to happen in these sort of you know, last couple of years and the next few, uh, just from where, where I said what I see, we want to get it right. We don't want to perpetuate and exasperate the problem. We want to make sure it sets it up for everybody to, to uh, thrive uh, in, in society. So that that's the biggest takeaway and, and it requires you to think about the fact that accomplishing your mission as a company is greater than just optimizing your uh, own sort of company's uh, metrics. And I think that that more macro sort of thinking and responsibility, how does that become part of the culture uh, is, a, is, a, is a key attribute that uh, hopefully we'll all embrace going forward. Hey, man, as somebody who's um, achieved a great deal of success in your realm, as well as somebody who's funded people who've had unusual levels of success, I wonder, are there, are, are there some um, secrets to those success that you would advise others who would wish to follow either in your footsteps or in the footsteps of some of the great entrepreneurs that you funded? Um, some attributes uh, that, that tend to be the difference makers uh, that for those who really achieve A-plus results in, in the career they've chosen. Yeah, I think I think for me, each career is different, right? So I, I, I can perhaps narrow that question to the role of an investor. Um, I think the most important thing is humility. And humility isn't, you know, writing these notes of how you're humbled by X, Y, Z. You know, I think humility is sort of understanding that um, our view of the future is not really important and sort of maintaining that beginner's mind and thinking about each innovation and each founder's vision with that open mind and helping them think about and imagine what it could be and and uh, stop believing in your own views. Because we get to say yes, no, all day to ideas. So at some point you start believing that uh, there's signal in that yes, no, and that's just really not true. I, I think not, le not forgetting that particular point is the only way to keep sustaining this because you get so many biases 
the more success accretes to you, the more biases you have because you've seen some things that worked. But the reality is that every great company that becomes legendary has its own journey and culture and doesn't really pattern match to the last one. Unlearning is a really, really important skill and mislearning is a really, really big risk as you do this uh, job for longer and longer. Great perspective, Hemant. Well, Hemant Taneja, thank you so much for taking time with me today. It's been, been great to hear more about your own theses represented across multiple books, the areas you're investing in and why, uh, some, your, some of your views about the, the future of business in a variety of different lanes. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye.